morning from Boston, everyone. Um, my name is Crandall Peeler. I'm the Director of Neuro-Ophthalmology at Boston Medical Center, and it's a great honor to be uh, with you today uh, for this Cross Minds Perspective to discuss uh, some interesting cases from neuro-ophthalmology. Uh, so just to provide an outline, um, what I'm hoping to discuss today are four challenging neuro-ophthalmology cases that are relevant to ophthalmologists practicing in, in India. And then in between each case, uh, we plan to provide some time for questions and, uh, and answers from me, hopefully. Uh, so getting started here, um, the first case that I wanted to talk about is a double vision or diplopia case. Uh, and this is a case of a 50-year-old man who reports uh, diagonal double vision going on for the last two months. Uh, so this is just a review of the patient's past medical history. So uh, his ocular history, he has diabetes, but no uh, retinopathy seen on previous eye exams. Um, and then for his other past medical history, he has hypertension and hyperlipidemia, and he takes uh, medications that are appropriate for these various conditions. Uh, he drinks occasionally, but doesn't smoke, um, and no relevant family history here. Uh, to give a little bit more detail about the history, two months prior to seeing me in my neuro-ophthalmology clinic, uh, the patient says that he first noticed some double vision while he was at work, and it came on uh, suddenly and spontaneously, there was no preceding injury or illness. Uh, the patient was examined by another ophthalmologist at the time who noticed that the right eye was not moving normally. So there was an adduction and superduction deficit on that side that was causing an exotropia and a right hypotropia that was concerning for a right third nerve palsy. There was no anaxicoria noted at the time. Um, but given the risk for some kind of a serious neurologic problem, the patient was sent to uh, an outside hospital and had an MRI scan of the brain with and without contrast and also an MR angiogram of the head. And these were both normal. So it didn't seem that there was any structural lesion or uh, aneurysmal compression of the third nerve in this patient. So ultimately, he was diagnosed with what was thought to be a, a microvascular third nerve palsy and he had the appropriate risk factors for this with his age and um, cardiovascular risk factors. But then fast forward one month later, um, the patient was following up with his outside ophthalmologist, and it seemed that the right eye was moving better. His exotropia that had been seen previously was getting better, but now he seemed to have a new left abduction deficit. And so the thought was, is he now developing a new left sixth nerve palsy as well? So at this point, because he had some evidence of multiple cranial neuropathies, uh, the patient was referred to see a neuro-ophthalmologist. Uh, so then I saw this patient, and uh, on his examination, he had good visual acuity, normal color perception, normal pupils normal interocular pressure and normal anterior segment and fundus examination. And on uh, checking of his motility, he continued to have a pretty significant uh, adduction deficit on the right eye that had first been noted a couple months prior. Also had the abduction deficit on the left that I'd heard about from the outside ophthalmologist, but also a partial a deduction deficit on the left. So maybe some components of a right third nerve palsy and a left sixth nerve palsy, but also this A deduction deficit that didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so at this point, trying to come up with a differential diagnosis for what could be going on with this patient. Um, one possibility is that he has multiple cranial neuropathies. Um, someone who is uh, older with multiple cardiovascular risk factors could have multiple microvascular cranial nerve palsies. I've seen this before. Um, and that could result in, you know, multiple lesions 
It's also possible that he could have some sort of infectious or inflammatory condition in the central nervous system that's causing uh, a multifocal issue. So uh, possibilities would be sarcoidosis, uh, Lyme infection that we see in the United States frequently, uh, tuberculosis or syphilis. Uh, also, a neoplastic condition, something like a central nervous system lymphoma that could cause multifocal uh, meningeal um, compression uh, of the cranial nerves, um, or a condition like IgG4 uh, that we see um, or we recognize more often in the United States now, uh, another autoimmune condition. Uh, also possible here um, could be an orbital problem, uh, something like thyroid eye disease that's causing uh, a restrictive process of thickening or uh, enlargement of the extraocular muscles uh, that could affect both eyes and cause these kind of nonspecific motility deficits. And then uh, the last thing on the differential would be some sort of a neuromuscular junction disorder uh, like myasthenia gravis. Uh, so what really helped me make the diagnosis in this case was uh, the physical exam. Um, and I have a video here to show uh, of one of the findings that really kind of clinched the diagnosis for me. And this was having the patient uh, perform a, a prolonged up gaze test. This, minute, this video is about a minute long. Um, and if you uh, watch to the end, you'll be able to see uh, the finding that, that made the diagnosis clear. So I'm having the patient look at my finger uh, straight up, and you can see he has this eye patch on his forehead that he's been wearing to manage his double vision. In around 15 or 20 seconds, you can see that his right upper eyelid starts to drop down a little bit. And now it's almost getting to the point where he can't even open the eye anymore. So this was evidence uh, I felt of uh, fatigability in this patient. Um, so, you know, I sent some additional labs, thyroid function testing came back normal, but um, kind of consistent with the physical exam, I also sent lab testing for myasthenia, specifically acetylcholine receptor binding antibodies. And these were significantly elevated above the reference range. So uh, ultimately, the diagnosis that we came to here was ocular myasthenia gravis. Uh, so to give a little bit more information on myasthenia, uh, this is an autoimmune condition that's characterized by uh, variable muscle weakness. And that was the case with this patient um, based on the history over the last couple months having initially what looked like a right third nerve palsy, and then uh, left sixth nerve palsy, and then some other motility deficits that didn't really fit any specific pattern. And patients with myasthenia have eyelid and extraocular muscle involvement about 90% of the time. 50% um, of patients will present with only ptosis or diplopia that we call ocular myasthenia. Uh, so in this case, only the eye muscles are involved, but they don't have any other systemic muscle weakness. And uh, myasthenia tends to have a bimodal distribution, so it tends to affect younger women and older men. And so this patient fell into that second category. And patients with ocular myasthenia, like this patient have had, it's important to recognize that this can progress to generalized myasthenia with respiratory and bulbar symptoms. Um, so even when I have a patient who seems to have definite myasthenia that is confined just to the ocular muscles, I still tend to refer them to a neurologist for a full evaluation just to make sure that there's no subtle systemic weakness that could suggest that they also have generalized disease. And this diagram, again, just kind of reviews the pathophysiology of myasthenia. So on the left side of the screen, you can see the nerve terminal uh, releasing acetylcholine into the synapse. And under normal circumstances, that will bind an acetylcholine receptor that causes muscle activation. But in cases of myasthenia, 
there are antibodies that are basically clogging up the synapse or binding to the acetylcholine receptor that block the acetylcholine from binding. And uh, in those cases, then muscle activation is inhibited. So uh, in diagnosing myasthenia, um, in this patient, the clinical signs were very apparent. So you can look for fatigability. Uh, and what I usually do is a prolonged upgaze test. Um, and sometimes it takes a little while. So I like to have patients look up at my finger for at least 30 or 60 seconds because it can take that long to start to see signs of fatigability. You can also look for a lid twitch where uh, you have the patient look down at your finger and then up at your nose and back and forth. And each time they look up at your nose, a positive lid twitch sign would be a kind of a jumping appearance of the eyelid. Um, you can also look for orbicularis weakness, so have the patient close their eyes as tightly as they can and just use your fingers to see if it, even with them squeezing as tightly as they can, are you still able to open their lids. And then curtaining, uh, if they have ptosis on one side and you lift the lid on the strong, on the Hepatic side, does the higher lid on the on the contralateral side seem to drop down? Uh, other confirmatory testing that could be performed is an ice test or a rest test. Um, so this is something that can be done in the office, either placing an ice pack on a on a totic eyelid or having the patient just sit back in the exam chair and close their eyes for 10 or 15 minutes and then come back and see does it seem like their symptoms have improved. Um, I I always do. Uh, serum antibody testing, specifically looking at the acetylcholine receptor binding antibody. Studies have shown this is about 70% sensitive in ocular myasthenia and essentially 100% specific. So if you have positive antibodies, that's a really good indicator that, that myasthenia is the problem. Um, historically, we used to do edrophonium testing in the clinic, but uh, now edrophonium is difficult to come by, at least in the United States. And then uh, the gold standard to diagnose myasthenia is electromyography. Specifically, uh, in ocular myasthenia, we're talking about a single fiber EMG where uh, the, the orbicularis is um, isolated and repeatedly stimulated. Um, and then when it comes to treatment for this condition, uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like pyridostigmine are uh, the first line. For patients with more severe disease or refractory to pyridostigmine, um, we can try corticosteroids or other immunomodulating um, medications. Uh, and these are very effective, but with steroids especially, there's this risk of precipitating a myasthenic crisis. Uh, so typically when I start patients on steroids, I start them at very low doses and gradually taper upwards until they see a sign of clinical effects. And I also warn them that with steroids, even if they have had only ocular myasthenic symptoms previously, there is a risk that they could rapidly develop um, respiratory or bulbar symptoms. And if this were to happen, uh, they should go to their local uh, nearest emergency room. And for patients who uh, have more generalized symptoms with swallowing difficulty, choking, breathing difficulty, either plasmapheresis or intravenous gamma globulin, um, administered in a hospital setting uh, can be very effective. Uh, and then there's also this question of thymectomy. So a lot of patients uh, who come in with myasthenia will be found to have a thymoma uh, or neoplastic changes of the thymus. And so an important part of the work up here is to get uh, some sort of chest imaging. And in patients who are found to have a thymoma, um, removing the thymoma can be very a very effective form of treatment. And after surgery, patients don't require any uh, additional medical therapy. So um, just to wrap up with our patient, uh, fortunately, his symptoms were fairly mild and could be uh, completely controlled just with um, pyridostigmine, 60 milligrams three times a day. Uh, and on his chest CT, there was no evidence of thymoma. Um, so he was happy uh, and was able to be controlled with minimal um, medical therapy. Um, so that's the first case. And I'm looking up here at the question link to see if we have any questions that I can 
discuss for you uh, for the next few minutes. So the first question that's coming in is from Dr. Isha Gala, um, and the question is, is there an association between diabetes and thyroid with myasthenia gravis? Um, that's a really good question. So, you know, I, uh, in giving the patient's past medical history, uh, I mentioned the fact that he was uh, diabetic, um, and I also talked about sending thyroid function labs. Um, so, you know, the, the focus on the diabetes and the high blood pressure and cholesterol issues uh, were to kind of set the scene that this could just be a microvascular cranial nerve palsy um, causing the patient's double vision symptoms. But as far as I'm aware, there's no, um, uh, you know, other than oftentimes diabetes and myasthenia being uh, autoimmune conditions, um, there's no uh, clear association between the two. Um, there is a strong association between thyroid disease, autoimmune thyroid disease, and myasthenia. Uh, and so uh, in the workup for the patient, I mentioned sending thyroid function testing. Uh, this was mainly just to see if his symptoms could be related to thyroid eye disease, but there is a significant overlap in patients who have autoimmune thyroid dysfunction and myasthenia. Uh, so a lot of times these, these conditions go hand in hand. Um, you know, as far as the diabetes goes, this patient was uh, type 2 diabetic, so um, thought to be more related to insulin resistance than uh, an autoimmune process like we see in, in type 1. Um, second question from Dr. Koresh Lascotti uh, says, we seldom use anything besides pure to Um Yeah, you know, I think that as an ophthalmologist, uh, pure to is a good place to start and end unless you feel really comfortable um, with some of these higher level immunosuppressive agents. Um, a lot of times pyridostigmine is very effective, um, particularly for the, the ptosis part of ocular myasthenia. Uh, but sometimes getting uh, patients seen single if they're having double vision symptoms as well can be more tricky. Um, so I think, you know, as a as a general ophthalmologist or a neuro-ophthalmologist who's ophthalmology trained, I think pyridostigmine is a good place to start. But if the patient continues to be symptomatic despite uh, up titrating the doses, um, I think then referring to uh, a neuromuscular specialist or a neurologist to talk about some of these other um, immunosuppressive agents is a good idea. Um, and then another question from Jatinder Wahi, uh, since how long has a, uh, has a patient, to, basically how long does a patient need to be on Um It depends on the patient. Uh, you know, myasthenia is an autoimmune condition and the pyridostigmine isn't really treating the underlying autoimmune condition. It's more treating um, this neuromuscular blockade that occurs as a result of the autoimmune condition. Um, with that being said, I still find that a lot of times uh, patients with myasthenia, the condition just kind of burns itself out after a while. And so I may have a patient on the pyridostigmine for six months or a year, um, as long as they're not having significant side effects from it. And then at that point, we may talk about starting to taper down off of the pyridostigmine and see if their symptoms return. And a lot of times they don't. Um, a lot of times once they're stabilized, uh, the symptoms resolve with the medication and then you can get them off in six months or a year. Uh, and they do, they do really well. Um, another question from Dr. Koresh Muscati. If this patient had seen you first, would you have ordered an MRI? Um, that's a really good question also. So <clears throat> uh, I kind of have uh, different testing criteria for what what looks like a cranial neuropathy, depending on if it's a third or a fourth or a sixth. 
Um, if this was a if this patient had come in with just the findings of uh, six nerve palsy that were initially seen in the left eye, I would not have ordered an MRI scan because he had the appropriate cardiovascular risk factors for a mic microvascular six nerve palsy. Um, but because the, the first presentation was what looked more like a third nerve palsy, <clears throat> even though there was no pupillary involvement, um, I probably still would have ordered imaging of the brain, specifically angiography, to rule out aneurysmal compression, just because it could have been an evolving third nerve palsy that was partial when he first presented, but was going to become more complete as a result of an expansile aneurysm compressing the, the right third nerve. So I think ordering the MRI scan in the first place was appropriate. Uh, but depending on what, what's available, uh, at your institution, I think either an MRA or a CTA of the head um, would have been reassuring in that case. Uh, the next question from Jatinder Wahi, how much, uh, basically what's the dosing of pyrostigmine? Uh, how high can you go? Um, so this patient uh, in our case was on very low doses of pyrostigmine, so 60 milligrams three times a day. Um, but I've had patients on uh, doses as high as 160 milligrams four times a day, uh, and that's with the immediate release formulation. There's also in the U.S. Uh, at least a, an extended release formulation that's more like once or twice a day dosing, and you just kind of add together all that you would use in the immediate release form and give it to them in the extended release form. Um, but typically, patients have side effects from higher doses of the medication um, that uh, limit how high you can go. And the main side effect uh, typically is diarrhea. Um, another question from Dr. Rudra uh, Prasad Ghosh, uh, can, neostigmine, can a neostigmine test be a good alternative to edrophonium? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I think uh, with any of these tests that are done in the office, uh, you know, we, we don't really do the edifronium test too much more in the U.S. because it's just not really manufactured in a, in a way that we can, uh, we can access. But uh, any of these tests are good in the office. It's just important to remember that um, people, can, people basically need some sort of heart rate or blood pressure monitoring during these tests because people can become profoundly bradycardic from these medications. Um, and so it's just important to have... Uh, the appropriate monitoring and, and medications that, that can be administered um, if somebody becomes bradycardic or uh, loses consciousness during one of these tests. Um, the next question from Dr. Koresh Muscati, would the ice pack test not have helped in the first instance? Uh, absolutely. I think it would have. Um, you know, the issue with myasthenia is uh, when it People don't always, it, it doesn't always come to the front of the differential when it is mimicking what looks like a fairly straightforward cranial nerve palsy. So I think when the patient first came in with this adduction and superduction deficit on the right, uh, it just seemed pretty classic for a partial third nerve palsy. And so I don't think that anybody was thinking about um, myasthenia at that point. Um, but I definitely think that an ice pack or rest test would have been helpful in seeing some improvement at that point. Uh, but it wasn't until the symptoms became more variable um, that, you know, myasthenia really popped into our heads. And, you know, I, I was fortunate seeing this patient two months after his symptoms started that I could see the trajectory that he'd had over those two months of uh, significant variability in his exam. Um, so I think... Uh, those were all great questions, and hopefully my answers were helpful. I think it's time to move on to the second case. Uh, so this next case is uh, one of sudden painless vision loss. Uh, so again, similarly aged 58-year-old uh, man who came in with uh, loss of the bottom half of his vision in the right eye about two days ago. So past medical history for this patient, he had been followed by an ophthalmologist for mild cataracts, uh, 
similar to, similar to the last patient, he also had some cardiovascular risk factors, so hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a history of coronary artery disease, and again, was on medications to treat these conditions. Um, also had a social history uh, that was not significant and uh, no real significant family history of any type of vision loss in the past. And to give a little bit more detail about what the patient was describing, he says uh, he just noticed this painless vision loss suddenly in his right eye only two days prior. Uh, again, there was no preceding injury or illness. And he feels that the vision is most blurry in the inferior hemifield. Uh, so basically inferior to the horizontal midline. He, he describes almost seeing like a dark shade or a smudge in his vision. Um, and any time a patient comes in with uh, sudden painless vision loss, a sudden, especially a patient who uh, is over the age of 50, I always ask them screening questions uh, for giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis. But he denied any symptoms of temporal headache, uh, jaw claudication, scalp tenderness, or myalgias. And on exam uh, with me in his affected right eye, his visual acuity was down slightly to 2040, 2020 on the left side. He also had dyschromatopsia, decreased color perception in the right eye by uh, testing with the Ishihara color plate. Uh, his pupils were equal in size, but he had a clear right afferent pupillary defect. Otherwise, intraocular pressure and anterior segment examinations were normal. And then on the dilated fundus examination, um, the crucial finding here is in the right eye, there appears to be some uh, segmental swelling, uh, so segmental meaning kind of the superior portion of the optic nerve appears swollen relative to the inferior portion uh, with some subtle nerve fiber layer hemorrhages associated with the swelling. Uh, and then the left optic nerve looks flat, normal, crisp margins. Um, but one important thing to note on the left side uh, is that the patient has uh, what appears to be a very small cup to disc ratio. And I also uh, obtained automated perimetry, so Humphrey visual field testing. And this is the pattern deviation plot just for the right eye. The left eye was normal, but uh, for the right eye, I thought this was a good demonstration of what the patient was describing. So basically everything below the horizontal meridian here, um, the patient was having a hard time seeing the light stimulus. So you can see that it's blacked out uh, in this printout from the Humphrey machine. So, um, Given the patient's uh, age, uh, the history, um, the exam findings uh, with uh, decreased visual acuity and afferent pupillary defect, dyschromatopsia, and segmental disc swelling, um, the diagnosis of non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy was made in this patient. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about NAION, um, an important thing to think about is what are the risk factors for this condition? Uh, what I tell patients and trainees is that anatomy uh, is really the primary risk factor for NAION. And what I mean by that is the anatomy of the optic nerve. So a small cup to disc ratio or what we call a disc at risk is seen in 97% of cases. And Basically, the way that I describe this to patients is you think about the optic nerve like a cable that connects the eye back to the brain and carries the visual information. And some people have uh, a very large cable or pipe that the optic nerve travels through, and there's a lot of space for those individual ganglion cell axons, as well as kind of a support cells and these tiny little blood vessels that provide oxygen to the optic nerve head. Other people have their optic nerve travel through a smaller conduit or a smaller pipe and everything is kind of packed in there a little bit more tightly. Um, and that is what predisposes people to having an ischemic event at the optic nerve head. Another risk factor um, that has been confirmed uh, in large scale studies is phosphodiesterase use. 
so um, people who were paying close attention when I was talking about this patient's past medical history may have seen that one of his medications was sildenafil. Uh, so in the United States, this is a sildenafil is marketed as Viagra, um, and the pharmaceutical company that manufactures this medication for erectile dysfunction has done a lot of post-market surveillance, um, looking at patients taking this medication, uh, and they have data on you know hundreds of thousands of prescriptions and um, millions of um, uh, pres- uh, medication uses. And basically what they found is that there is a two-fold increased risk of having NAION with uh, phosphodiesterase use. Um, the risk of NAION in the general population is very small. In the U.S., it's something like 1 in 100,000 uh, people over the age of 50. So with phosphodiesterase use, it goes up to something like 2 in 100,000. So still the risk is very small, but if you take something with a really small risk and double it, that's a, that's a significant effect. So I often counsel patients if they've had NAION in one eye that they may want to be wary about using these medications in the future. Age is also a significant risk factor. So 75% of patients who present with NAION are over the age of 50. Uh, cardiovascular risk factors here play a, play a role as well. So hypertension um, is a risk factor. Uh, there's also a thought that episodic hypotension, uh, specifically hypotension occurring with sleep, um, could be a risk factor. Um, this is a theory just because a lot of patients with NAION report that they wake up with the visual symptoms. So they, in the morning, they wake up and they notice that they've had a change in their vision. Uh, and then other cardiovascular risk factors like hypercholesterolemia, diabetes play a role. Obstructive sleep apnea is also felt to be a risk factor. And then optic dysdrusen. Uh, and this goes back to anatomy again. So anything that is causing, you know, more crowding at the optic nerve head. Um, is a risk factor for having an ischemic event. It's also important to think about things that are not a risk factor for NAION. So really importantly, an embolus is not a risk factor for this. So this has been examined extensively on histologic studies um, in patients who have had past NAION, and an embolus is not found in these cases. So this is not thought to be uh, a clot or a cholesterol plaque coming from the carotids or a thrombus that breaks off uh, from a heart valve or a chamber of the heart. Um, and, you know, to go into a little bit more description or explanation about why it makes sense that this is not an embolic phenomenon, um, you know, if we look at, at the vascular supply to the optic nerve, so along the course of the optic nerve here behind the eye, most of the blood supply comes from these perforating blood vessels uh, from the from the meninges that surround the optic nerve, specifically from the peel layer. Uh, and there is, it ha- it, there's a dense anastomotic network here. Um, and there's also blood supply from the central retinal artery that penetrates into the optic nerve with multiple perforating little blood vessels along the course of the optic nerve. Uh, and then the optic nerve head here, the laminar portion and the pre-laminar portion, the blood supply comes primarily from branches of the posterior ciliary arteries here that uh, penetrate the sclera and enter the choroid in the area around the optic nerve head. And again, there are these dense anastomotic networks. So the risk of having a sudden uh, ischemic event from an embolus is small just because if a, if a cholesterol plaque or a thrombus lodge somewhere in uh, the central retinal artery or one of these other smaller arteries, you'd still have uh, significant um, blood flow from other from other places. Um, but at the optic nerve head, uh, we talk about the, the circle of Zinn Holler, which is basically this, this circle of uh, blood vessels that penetrate the laminar and pre-laminar portion of the optic nerve that is supplied by the posterior ciliary ciliary artery, and this circle is kind of broken up into a a superior half or superior semicircle and an inferior semicircle. Um, 
And dysfunction of one of these halves of the circle of Zin Haller is what's thought to uh, cause NAION and result in this segmental optic disc swelling, either the, the top half or the bottom half of the disc that we typically see in these patients. Um, so, you know, the mechanism, having gone over the anatomy now, it's thought to be some sort of dysfunction of vascular homeostasis and autoregulation at the optic nerve head. So again, this laminar and prelaminar portion of the optic nerve that's supplied by the, the posterior ciliary artery. So prior to symptom onset, there's some sort of subclinical reduction in blood flow to the optic nerve head, uh, you know, related to some of these risk factors that I was talking about before, either hypertension or nocturnal hypotension. And this leads to subtle edema of the optic nerve axon and then uh, when you combine this with, with this major anatomic risk factor of a small cup-to-disc ratio or causing this crowded optic nerve outlet, uh, you reach this tipping point where this subtle edema of the optic nerve axon suddenly reach a point where you develop an acute compartment syndrome and you end up with frank vascular occlusion and infarction that's typically segmental, again, either the top half or the bottom half of the nerve. Uh, and that's when the patient clinically notices um, this sudden painless vision loss. So diagnosing NAION, um, you know, the mo in my opinion, the most important thing is to rule out arteritic forms of ischemic, ischemic optic neuropathy, uh, specifically giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis. Um, both by uh, taking a history, uh, asking questions like we talked about at the beginning of this case with um, temporal headaches, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication, myalgias, unintentional weight loss, but also doing uh, serum laboratory testing, um, checking a uh, sedimentation rate and uh, C-reactive protein. Um, but otherwise, if the findings are typical, as they are in this case, uh, not much workup is really required. So again, because this is not an embolic phenomenon, no imaging of the carotids or an echocardiogram is necessary, and no MRI of the brain is necessary because, uh, you know, when you have these typical when you have these typical features, it's not thought to be uh, compressive or infectious or inflammatory etiology. Um, and then what I typically do is monitor these patients closely. Um, any signs of worsening vision or visual field changes more than two weeks after the symptom onset should prompt consideration of other diagnoses, um, such as infectious, inflammatory, or compressive optic neuropathies. Uh, and then in treating NAION, the bottom line here, uh, unfortunately, is that a lot of things have been studied, but nothing has really been shown to be effective in recovering vision in these patients. Um, so one of the big randomized trials that was performed back in the 90s was the ischemic optic nerve decompression trial. This is a randomized controlled trial based on this idea of a compartment syndrome uh, really being at the root of what's causing vision loss here. And the idea was that people felt like if this is a compartment syndrome, then if we go in and we make a little scleral opening where the optic nerve enters the back of the eye to relieve that compartment, uh, is there a chance that the vision could improve? And this trial was actually stopped early because uh, the treatment arms um, ended up doing significantly worse uh, visually than the, the control group. Steroids have also been studied extensively in many trials, and there was only one retrospective trial um, by Hayray that showed uh, a benefit to treating these patients with steroids, and, and there were a lot of serious study design flaws um, in this paper. So uh, I think generally the consensus is that corticosteroid treatment uh, for ischemic optic neuropathy um, is not indicated. Um, Anti-VEGF. Uh, medications that are injected intravitrally uh, have also been suggested um, but haven't really been shown to be effective in recovering any vision in these patients. Um, and then the most uh, kind of cutting-edge research that's going on right now is into neuroprotective agents. 
So um, medications that are meant to be anti-apoptotic, for example, uh, they could be injected intravitreally, um, targeted at the optic nerve head. But unfortunately, there hasn't been there haven't been any uh, really promising results from these studies. Uh, there was a major uh, international randomized clinical trial that uh, was being conducted in the United States, and I also think it was there were sites in India and China as well uh, for one of these medications. Uh, and the goal was to enroll uh, 700 patients with NAION and randomize them to receive either this one of these new neuroprotective agents intravitreally or a sham injection. Um, but this study was also recently halted early, not because of any risk from the treatment, um, but just because it did not appear that the, this novel treatment had any effect on improving visual outcomes. Uh, in the clinical course with NAION, um, nearly half of patients end up with a vision of 2064 or better. Um, so typically, people are left with a mild visual acuity deficit. About a third can have pretty significant vision loss. Um, and I usually tell patients uh, when they first come in about this rule of third. So basically what that means is that a third of people after symptom onset may get a little bit better. A third of people typically stay exactly the same. And a third of people get a little bit worse. And that's just within kind of that first two-week window after symptom onset. Um, I mentioned previously that if people tend to, if people seem like they're getting worse after two weeks, that would prompt you to think about other diagnoses. Um, and then another important thing to counsel patients on is that ipsilateral repeat NAION is exceedingly rare. So NAION happening twice in the same eye is really uncommon. And that's just because the thought is once you have this ischemic event, uh, the anatomical risk factors are relieved somewhat in that optic nerve as you have some ganglion cell death, uh, that small cup to disc ratio, the, the crowding at the optic nerve head is relieved somewhat. But contralateral NAION is fairly common just, again, because if people have a, a disc at risk in one eye, they typically have it in the other eye. And the contralateral risk is about 15% uh, within five years and 30% over the course of a patient's life. This is data that we have from that ischemic optic neuropathy decompression trial from the 90s. Uh, and I typically recommend uh, if patients have it in one eye that they start taking a, an 81 milligram aspirin and avoid taking blood pressure medications at night, again, just to avoid this theoretical risk from nocturnal hypotension. But there's really not a lot of evidence to back up either of these recommendations. Uh, so back to our patient, his vision remains stable over multiple follow-up visits. Uh, and at his six-week visit, his optic nerve swelling had resolved, uh, and now he was left with segmental pallor. And that's typically what we see. So in the acute phase, you see segmental disc swelling with some nerve fiber layer hemorrhage, by, but by about six weeks, the swelling and, and hemorrhage resolved, and the patient is left with optic nerve pallor. Uh, so that's the second case, and it looks like um, we're starting to get some questions here uh, as well. So um, the first question... Uh, from uh, Rushad Shroff, is there any role of imaging modalities like fluorescein angiogram in making the diagnosis? Uh, there is, especially if you are uh, kind of on the fence about whether this is a non-arteritic versus arteritic form of ischemic optic neuropathy. <clears throat> so NAION is going, you, on fluorescein, you're going to see optic disc leakage. Um, just like with a lot of other forms of optic neuropathy that cause optic disc swelling. It's not really specific to NAION, but it can still be helpful to make the diagnosis. Um, where I usually uh, tend to use FA is, again, these cases where um, maybe there's some symptoms that suggest GCA, uh, maybe the labs are kind of equivocal, the ESR and the CRP, um, and uh, what you can use the FA for is to see if there's any evidence of patchy choroidal filling. So in patients who have GCA, a lot of times there can be um, uh, ischemic areas of choroid as well uh, that could suggest a more diffuse vasculitic process going on that would steer you more in the direction of treating for giant cell as opposed to saying this is a, an NAION case where no treatment is required. Um, the next question from Dr. Rudra Prasad Ghosh. So, any relation with taking antihypertensives 
medications before bedtime. So yeah, um, again, you know, there is this theoretical risk that nocturnal hypotension can trigger um, NAION uh, because a lot of patients wake up with uh, noticing the vision loss. Um, and, you know, what I typically tell people is if you're taking blood pressure medications before bed, I would talk to your primary doctor about seeing if you can switch to the morning. Um, because, you know, I, I, I don't know if I believe this nocturnal hypotension theory. Uh, some of the bigger studies have shown that about a third of people with NION report that they wake up with it in the morning. Uh, but if you think about it, you know, we, most people spend about eight hours of their day asleep. Uh, which would be about a third of the day. So just kind of statistically speaking, you would expect that about a third of people wake up with it. Um, but it could there could be some role of nocturnal hypotension. So I don't think it hurts to uh, move people's blood pressure medications to the morning if they're taking them before bed. Um, the next question from Dr. Rashad Shroff, uh, what kind of follow-up should be done for the following eye and how frequently? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't think that you necessarily need to follow these patients on any kind of regular basis for the contralateral eye. I typically just tell them that if they notice any vision changes uh, in that other eye to come in right away. Um, you know, sometimes if you're following these patients on, on every four month or every six month basis, you can actually see optic nerve swelling develop. <coughs> excuse me, in the contralateral eye before the patient has any vision loss symptoms. This is kind of that early NION phase where you start to get some uh, edema of the ganglion cell axons before they ha develop this frank compartment syndrome. But again, there's not really anything to do about it, unfortunately. Um, you know, you may see the swelling and then a few weeks or a month later, they have the sudden painless vision loss in that eye. Uh, but again, like the, you know, there's nothing, there's no real treatment that's indicated at that point, other than trying to potentially optimize the patient's um, outpatient medications for their various cardiovascular risk factors like blood pressure and diabetes. Um, the next question, Dr. Koresh Mascotti, would you give aspirin to every patient you diagnose to prevent attack in the contralateral eye? Um, I do recommend to all these patients, if they're not already taking an 81 milligram <coughs> aspirin that they started, if they don't have some other uh, systemic contraindication to taking aspirin. Um, but uh, again, the, the evidence for that in terms of preventing NAION in the contralateral eye is, is very scant. Um, it's just one of those things where I feel like we don't have a lot to offer these patients. And I think that the risk of starting low-dose aspirin is fairly low. So if there is any benefit to it, I think it's worth doing. Uh, then the next question, uh, also from Dr. Koresh Muscati, can you explain the two-week window again? Sure. Um, so with NAION, people have this sudden painless vision loss. Um, and we anticipate that there could be some worsening over the course of the first two weeks. Uh, and the reason for that is when people come in with um, ischemic optic neuropathy and a swollen optic nerve, we expect that those swollen ganglion cell axons kind of exist on a spectrum. So um, some of them are dead and they're not coming back. And that explains the vision loss that the patients have right away. Um, and then some of the ganglion cell axons are fine, like the, the portion of the nerve that's not swollen, um, those are continuing to function normally. But then in the middle of that spectrum, there are some swollen ganglion cell axons that are sick, but have the chance to recover. Uh, and so over the course of those first two weeks, some of those sick axons um, may kind of enter this phase of apoptosis and die off, whereas some of them uh, may recover. And so if some of those axons die off, additional axons die off. It typically happens in the first two weeks, and that's when people may notice some worsening vision. But at that two-week mark, we expect that everybody will kind of be at their final visual outcome. So if they continue to have worsening beyond that point, that's when we say, hmm, this seems like there may be something else going on here besides 
N-A-I-O-N, something like uh, an infectious inflammatory or compressive optic neuropathy. And that's when I kind of start to uh, consider other diagnoses and, and other workups, uh, like serum testing for infectious causes or getting an MRI scan to make sure that there's not a compressive lesion. Then the next question from uh, Jatin Yawahi, um, how much uh, or what doses of uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors is it safe for people above 50 to be taking? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, and we don't know, you, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that this, there had been some post-marketing surveillance done by uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. for phosphodiesterase inhibitor use. And... Uh, that twofold increased risk that they saw was independent of dose. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't like a higher risk for higher doses and a lower risk for lower doses. Uh, it was with any phosphide, phosphodiesterase use. Um, so when I am counseling patients about these risks, um, I just say kind of make a blanket statement about erectile dysfunction medications um, that there is this Slight increased risk of using them, period. And, and and I don't really talk about any any safe level of use or safe frequency of use. I just say you kind of have to think about the benefits of these medications versus this um, well established potential risk of repeat NAION in the contralateral eye. Um, so I think it's time to move on to case number three. Thank you for all those great questions. Uh, so the next case uh, is one of bilateral optic nerve swelling. Uh, so this is a 20-year-old woman who reports that she's been having blurry vision and chronic headaches. Uh, so her past medical history, um, nothing from an ocular perspective. Um, from uh, otherwise general medical history, uh, she has polycystic ovary syndrome as well as obesity. Her only medication is an oral contraceptive pill, no smoking or alcohol use, and um, no significant family history. Um, getting a little bit more detail into her symptoms. So she reports that she's been having off and on blurry vision for the last three months, noting that the vision in both eyes either grays out or blacks out for a few seconds uh, with position change, so bending over or standing up quickly. <clears throat> she also reports hearing a whooshing sound in her ears for the last few months. And she has uh, chronic headaches that she says she's had for years, but they seem to be getting worse, also worse when she's laying down. So uh, sometimes it will wake her from sleep or she'll feel like when she first wakes up in the morning, the headaches are the worst. And on my examination, she has uh, fairly normal visual acuity, 20-30 in both eyes full color perception um, by Ishihara, Ishihara color plates. Pupils are equal in size with no afferent pupillary defect, <clears throat> and her anterior statement examination was normal. Um, but the main finding here is on her dilated exam. Uh, and in this case, uh, we can see that she has bilateral optic nerve head swelling. So it seems a little bit more significant on the right side uh, with some uh, definite elevation and blurring of the margins and also some obscuration of the vessels near the margin of the optic disc on the right side. On the left side, she also has 360 degrees of elevation and blurring of the disc margin, but uh, most of the vessels are still uh, pretty clearly visualized. Um, and uh, because she had bilateral optic nerve swelling, she had an MRI scan. Um, to rule out uh, a mass lesion that could be causing uh, elevated intracranial pressure. And there were no tumors seen, but she did have some interesting findings. Uh, the image on the left is a sagittal uh, picture uh, that includes the, the brainstem and the stella. And what we see in the stella here that's marked in the image is what we call a, a partially empty stella, where it looks like the pituitary gland is kind of squished down into the stella. So that's that um, whiter area that's labeled at 3.7 millimeters in height, and then above that is kind of empty space. Uh, in the right picture, this is an axial uh, image from the MRI that shows the globe 
um, but also shows this increased uh, CSF space, uh, cerebrospinal fluid space around the optic nerve um, that looks like kind of a cuff of bright fluid around the nerve. And then we can also see some flattening of the posterior globe. And then uh, she also had uh, an MR venogram, in this case, making sure that she didn't have a dural venous sinus thrombosis that could be causing elevated intracranial pressure. And again, fortunately, she did not have any signs of a blood clot, but what the arrows are indicating here is that she had some narrowing of her uh, venous sinuses bilaterally. Um, and then the next step in her workup, uh, given that she had this bilateral optic nerve swelling, was to perform a lumbar puncture. Uh, and what was found there was an opening pressure of 38 centimeters of water, uh, with the normal opening pressure being 25 centimeters of water or less. Uh, and normal cell counts and constitu constituents on testing of the cerebrospinal fluid that was obtained. Uh, so in, in this case, in a patient with a young woman, uh, a case of a young woman with um, headaches, pulsatile tinnitus, uh, and bilateral optic nerve swelling with uh, no structural lesions on MRI and an elevated opening pressure, the diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension was made. So the diagnostic criteria here, as I just kind of touched upon, uh, is elevated CSF opening pressure uh, with, a, with a lumbar puncture performed in the lateral decubitus position and normal uh, CSF constituents. And so the reason that we're sending this fluid uh, to the lab is to make sure that there's no signs of infection or meningitis, inflammation, or neoplasm that could be uh, explaining the elevated opening pressure. And patients also have to have basically a clean uh, clean imaging of the head. So in our case, we got an MRI and MRV that showed no mass lesion or venous thrombosis, but it did show uh, what are now thought to be very characteristic imaging findings in patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension, specifically this empty or partially empty cella, uh, increased CSF space around the optic nerve, flattening of the posterior globe, um, and uh, narrowing of the venous sinuses. And you also have to rule out any secondary cause of intracranial hypertension. Um, most commonly, these are medications that are known to elevate intracranial pressure, specifically vitamin A analogs. These are medications that, at least in the U.S., are typically used to treat acne, so uh, either topical vitamin A analogs or um, oral vitamin A analogs, tetracyclines as well. Uh, the class of antibiotics are known to cause uh, secondary elevations and increase of uh, intracranial pressure. Um, oral contraceptive pills, uh, like this patient was on, uh, increase the risk of dural venous sinus thrombosis, um, and that's the way that they can potentially uh, secondarily elevate intracranial pressure. But this patient wasn't found to have any blood clots on her venogram. Um, in terms of the path pathophysiology of IIH, um, it's thought to be related to decreased cerebrospinal fluid absorption by the arachnoid villi, uh, as well as increased venous pressure um, in the dural venous sinuses. Uh, and I mentioned that uh, it's become much more apparent uh, with with uh, high uh, high quality imaging. Um, that these patients tend to have narrowing of the venous sinuses. And uh, it's not really clear whether they have some sort of congenital anomaly of the venous sinuses that, that causes this narrowing and the increased venous pressure that decreases uh, cerebral spinal fluid reabsorption, or whether the narrowing that's seen on imaging is secondary to the high pressure in the head. Um, my opinion is that it's likely secondary to the high pressure. Uh, the venous sinuses are distensible structures, and so as the pressure in the head goes up, it makes sense to me that they would become more narrow. And there have also been some pretty good imaging studies in these patients that have shown they'll have a venogram prior to a lumbar puncture where they, you see this narrowing of the venous sinuses, and then they have a lumbar puncture that decreases 
uh, the intracranial pressure temporarily, and they immediately have another MR venogram that shows uh, that the venous sinuses appear much more patent. Um, there's also endocrine factors. Uh, you know, this condition is one that I uh, see almost exclusively in young, overweight females. And so there's a thought that uh, hormones, specifically <clears throat> estrogen, play a role in um, CSF reabsorption uh, and uh, creating this condition. Um, in terms of treatment for these patients, uh, the first line is acetazolamide which is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, and this works by decreasing production of cerebrospinal fluid. So if the problem is, you know, that the CSF is not draining out appropriately and this is causing the intracranial pressure to go up and causing all the symptoms that we see in these patients, then by basically turning down the faucet by decreasing the production of CSF, uh, patients tend to improve clinically and feel a lot better. Um, but sometimes patients either can't tolerate acetazolamide um, due to side effects or have some sort of allergic reaction to the medication. And then the second line treatment that I typically try is to pyramate, uh, which is a kind of a uh, broad spectrum headache treatment and also anti-epileptic medication. But it has some uh, weaker carbonic anhydrase inhibitor activity similar to acetazolamide as well as some appetite suppressant effect that can be really effective in these patients. So it both decreases the production of cerebral spinal fluid, but can also be really effective in helping these patients with weight loss. Uh, and then the third line treatment in, the, in, in these patients is surgical. So um, basically surgery is indicated in these patients anytime that there is worsening afferent visual function despite maximum tolerated medical therapy. Uh, so, this is, it's rare that we have to go to surgery, um, but it is useful to have uh, to protect people's vision if they're still doing poorly despite being on medication. And the surgical options that are available uh, are optic nerve sheath fenestration, so basically um, having a neuro-ophthalmologist or uh, oculoplastic specialist who's trained in orbital surgery um, make small slits in the dura surrounding the optic nerve to release. Uh, other options that are typically performed by our neurosurgical colleagues would be either a ventriculo peritoneal VP or lumbo peritoneal LP shunt. And this is just putting, you know, a, a, an accessory drainage pathway in to help drain out cerebrospinal fluid, um, either from one of the ventricles or from the space around the spinal cord into the peritoneum. And, and these shunts have uh, valves placed on them so that uh, the, the pressure can basically be set to a level that the patient feels comfortable. Um, the newest kind of surgical intervention uh, that I think it sounds very interesting um, and holds a lot of promise is venous sinus stenting. And so this is an endovascular technique uh, where a stent is placed in uh, one of those narrowed areas of the venous sinus um, and basically props it open. And this uh, has been shown to have significant effect in helping with uh, cerebrospinal fluid uh, drainage and egress. Uh, and then one treatment that's recommended for all patients is weight loss, as this has been shown to have significant uh, effect in reducing the severity of the disease. So our patient um, was started on 500 milligrams of extended release acetazolamide twice a day, and by six weeks, her headaches and optic nerve swelling had significantly improved, uh, as had her transient visual obscurations, these feelings of graying out or blacking out of the vision that she was having in both eyes with position change, and her pulsatile tinnitus, that whooshing sound that she had noticed in both ears had resolved. Um, so that's the end of case number three, and, and uh, we're, so we're starting to get some questions here. So the first one from Rashad Shroff, what is the dose of acetazolamide and supiramate that you normally prescribe? That's a really good question. So there's a really wide range of dosing that you can use for acetazolamide, uh, starting with that one first. So um, 
In mild cases, I typically start with either uh, with 500 milligrams of extended release acetazolamide, either once daily or twice daily. Um, and I'd say probably 50% of my patients are maintained on that dose and do well. Um, you know, I try to limit the, medica- the, the dosage of the medication as much as I can just to try and limit the side effects that patients get from acetazolamide that are really annoying. Um, you know, the main side effects would be paresthesias or tingling in the hands and feet, uh, changes in taste, um, upset stomach. Um, but some patients require significantly higher doses. Um, and I sometimes go as high as two grams of extended release acetazolamide twice a day. So a total of four grams daily is thought to be safe. Once you get up to those levels, uh, a lot of um, experts recommend checking some, uh, you know, ba- a basic chemistry panel monthly or twice a month just to make sure that, uh, just to check bicarb levels in the, these patients to make sure that um, they're not spilling too much bicarb in their urine as a result of being on these very high dose diuretics. Uh, in terms of topiramate, Uh, I usually start also pretty low, like 25 milligrams at bedtime, uh, and may work my way up to 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams at bedtime or 50 milligrams twice a day, depending on how well the patient tolerates it. Um, I find that the tapiramate uh, also has some associated uh, side effects. It mainly just makes people feel kind of sleepy or out of it. Um, But if they take it before bed, it's better tolerated and it can actually help with sleep. Um, but because there, there is a risk of more severe side effects with the pyramid, uh, specifically kind of severe allergic reactions or hematologic reactions, I, I typically reserve it as a second line medication. Um, another question from Rashad Shroff is morbid obesity, uh, in morbid obesity, is there a role for bariatric surgery and management of weight loss? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we think that one of the main, the main factor driving this condition is obesity and metabolically active uh, adipose tissue um, that's being stockpiled in these patients. Um, and uh, a lot of patients get to a point where it's very difficult for them to exercise uh, and have much success with weight loss because just mobility for them is difficult. Uh, and so we do work hand in hand at my institution uh, with nutritionists as well as uh, our gastroenterology colleagues. And patients who have a really difficult time with weight loss on their own do end up ultimately being candidates for bariatric surgery. And I've seen a lot of really successful uh, cases of either gastric sleeve surgery or gastric bypass surgery where patients have had significant weight loss after the surgery and um, this condition just resolves completely. Uh, patients who, who are at this level of needing to be on four grams of acetazolamide a day soon after the surgery can be tapered off the medication completely. Uh, so that can be a really good kind of long-term treatment uh, for the right patient. <clears throat> um, the next question from Jatinder Wahi, how long do we wait and carry on with Um So I'm, I'm thinking what, what you mean with that question is, uh, how long would you continue a patient on Um before trying to taper versus how long would you continue them on the medication before considering surgery? Um, So, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, patients often ask, am I going to have to be on this medication for life? My answer to them is no. Um, You know, I don't have any grandmas that come into my clinic that are still taking acetazolamide. This is exclusively a condition of young women. So uh, typically, uh, you know, 20s and 30s age, and a lot of times, the condition will kind of burn itself out over the course of a few years. So um, I've had uh, some patients who uh, have been on acetazolamide for relatively short courses, like six months, and were able to taper them down either to very low doses or off the medication at that point, and their symptoms don't return. Sometimes I've had patients uh, on the medication uh, for years um, before they were able to taper It kind of depends on the patient's age at presentation, and it also really depends on their success with weight loss, um, independent of of medical therapy. 
Um, if the question is more kind of focused on how long do we stick with acetazolamide versus going to something more definitive like surgical therapy, uh, I try to avoid surgery at all costs um, just because these neurosurgical interventions can have significant um, uh, complications associated with them. So if I can treat patients medically, I try to stick with that as much as I can. Um, the next question from uh, Dr. Koresh Muscati. Some of my patients have refused acetazolamide due to side effects that slowly improve with just weight loss. Um, I have been in the same situation as well with patients. Um, you know, I think that if patients want to stay off medication and just try to lose weight, I can support that. I just follow them closely with um, visual field testing, visual acuity testing, and some sort of e either optic disc photos or, or detailed description of the optic disc uh, swelling so that I can be certain that they do not have worsening apparent visual function going forward off medication. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, people will try just weight loss over the, you know, for six months or a year, and they may not have much success, but um, as long as their vision and their visual field testing remains stable or improves, I'm happy just, like I said, to continue to monitor them off medication. Uh, but if there's any evidence that things are getting worse, either from a symptomatic standpoint or from a, an apparent visual function standpoint, then I would have a serious conversation with them again about either restarting the acetazolamide or trying Topamax, uh, the topiramate medication, uh, to see if they have fewer side effects from that. So those are all great questions. Um, this is a condition that I see very commonly in my practice. Um, and a lot of these issues that you asked about are things that come up um, on a regular basis. Uh, fortunately, I, you know, I, I do not have to send very many of these patients for surgery. Um, but I do think that this, this new technique of being a sinus stenting holds a lot of potential. Um, just because the older techniques of um, optic nerve sheath fenestration and uh, either VP or LP shunting have a lot of associated risks with them. So obviously, anytime you're uh, sticking a knife near the optic nerve, like what's done in uh, optic nerve sheath fenestration, you're risking uh, severe permanent optic nerve injury and vision loss. And optic nerve sheath fenestration also is really only a temporary fix for this condition. VP and LP shunting, uh, you know, the, these shunts fail all the time, even if the surgery is not complicated. And so patients may have them working well for six months or a year, but then they get clogged or, or they uh, become malpositioned and they don't work as well. And the patients need to have another neurosurgical procedure. The shunts can also get infected uh, and cause problems that way. But this venous sinus stenting procedure, this intravascular procedure, has, has been studied pretty extensively recently in the U.S. Uh, and the risks during the surgery are fairly minimal, uh, and they tend to have very durable and long-lasting effects uh, for these patients. So I do think that that's probably going to be the, the best surgical treatment going forward. Uh, so thanks again for all those great questions. Uh, and then I think it's time to move on to our last case. So case number four is one of uh, profound, painful vision loss. So this is a 59-year-old man who came in with four days of vision loss in the right eye that was associated with significant pain with eye movement. Uh, so this patient's past medical history, similar to our, our previous older gentleman, so he had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, <clears throat> but otherwise, uh, no preceding injury or illness. Uh, the patient's ocular history was significant for long-standing poor vision in his left eye, so the other eye. He'd had a trauma when he was a teenager and so was basically monocular. Um, and so he was coming in now with new visual changes in his right eye, which had previously been his good eye. His medications, again, were consistent with his medical history. He uh, was a non-smoker, no alcohol and had no significant uh, family history. Uh, to give a little bit more detail about his presentation, so he said that he was having gradual worsening of vision and increasing pain 
with eye movement on the right for the last four days. There was no preceding injury or illness. And his left eye, the eye that he had this trauma in as a teenager, seemed stable. His vision wasn't great, but it hadn't really changed. It was at its baseline. And on my exam, his visual acuity in the right eye was 2100. Uh, and that had previously been 2020. His left eye was 2400. And that was his baseline since this injury as a teenager. He had dyschromatopsia in the right eye uh, by Ishihara color plates. He was unable to see even the control plate um, with his left eye. And then his pupils were equally round, um, but he had a right after pupillary defect. <clears throat> the anterior segment was normal in both eyes, but in the posterior pole, he had uh, grade two optic nerve swelling uh, in the right eye. The left eye, he had this large macular scar that was related to this trauma as a teenager, but his optic nerve otherwise was normal in appearance. And then uh, on automated perimetry on hum Humphrey visual field testing, the right eye, he, this was again, normally his good eye, he had diffuse depression uh, with a mean deviation of minus 32. The left eye, he had this temporal defect and kind of superior arcuate defect that was stable for him. And that was related to this large macular scar that he had from previous trauma. Um, and so uh, he, had an MRI scan with contrast, and this axial T1 post-contrast image demonstrates significant uh, enhancement of the right optic nerve that's indicated here by the red arrows. So basically the entire optic nerve uh, from where it plugs into the back of the globe, uh, back almost to the chiasm was lighting up with contrast in this patient. So the workup and treatment for him because he was functionally monocular and appeared to have some, some form of optic neuritis, but with atypical features that I'll get into in more detail in a minute, uh, he was admitted to the hospital for further testing and treatment. <clears throat> uh, serum testing for angiotensin converting en enzyme for sarcoidosis, uh, Lyme disease, syphilis, and uh, tuberculosis testing were all negative. These are kind of some usual suspects for uh, atypical inflammatory or infectious optic neuritis. <clears throat> he received three days of IV methylprednisolone while in the hospital, followed by a two-week oral prednisone taper with rapid uh, visual improvement in the right eye. So that was reassuring. He also had some other antibody testing for atypical forms of optic neuritis that I'll list here and get into more detail in in a moment. So he had antibody testing for NMO that was negative, um, but he had antibody testing for this condition, uh, this antibody called MOG that was positive. So the final diagnosis in this patient was anti-MOG positive optic neuritis. Um, so I'm sure that we've all seen cases of typical optic neuritis that occur um, commonly in young women where they have uh, vision loss that gradually worsens over the course of a week or two associated with pain with eye movement. Uh, MRI scan, if available, shows enhancement of the optic nerve. Um, and this can occur either in isolation or with enhancement or white matter changes elsewhere in the brain uh, that can be seen with the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And typically in these patients, uh, whether you treat them with corticosteroids or not, uh, their vision tends to reach a nadir uh, or bottom points ar around the two-week mark and then gradually improve over the course of a few weeks or a few months back to baseline. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes patients come in with what looks like opt uh, optic neuritis um, with painless or sorry painful vision loss and enhancement on MRI scan, but they have some atypical features. So one atypical feature uh, that was present in this case was fairly significant optic disc swelling. Um, so we know from the optic neuritis treatment trial that in cases of typical optic neuritis, two-thirds of patients have a normal appearing optic nerve head on dilated fundus exam when they present. The other one-third may have some very mild optic nerve swelling, but it almost just looks like a haziness of the disc margin. There's no, there's, 
does not tend to be any significant disc elevation. This patient had pretty marked optic nerve swelling, and sometimes patients will also present with hemorrhage that's not typical of uh, demyelinating or MS-associated optic neuritis. Another atypical feature would be severe vision loss. Uh, so our patients uh, had a visual acuity of 2100, but uh, some patients will come in with light perception or no light perception level vision uh, or significant progression of their vision loss after one week, and this would be considered an atypical finding for optic neuritis. Also, bilaterality is atypical in adults. So children can have bilateral optic neuritis that would be considered kind of classic demyelinating, demyelinating or multiple sclerosis-associated optic neuritis, but that's very unusual in adults. <clears throat> Another atypical finding in optic neuritis would be uh, frequently recurrent or steroid-dependent optic neuritis. So most of the time in a typical case with a young woman, she comes in and she has an episode of optic neuritis, it's MRI confirmed. She either is treated with steroids or not, but she improves. When the steroids are stopped, she remains stable over the course of the next year. Uh, but some patients uh, come in with what looks like optic neuritis and they're treated with steroids, but soon after the steroids are tapered off, within a week or, or a month, uh, the optic neuritis symptoms return. That would be considered an atypical finding. Uh, and prior to about a decade ago, these cases were just labeled as atypical. <clears throat> but over the last decade, we are starting to get a better sense of the pathophysiology of these atypical cases. <clears throat> and there are also several new commercially available antibody tests that have emerged to help classify and guide treatment in these cases of atypical optic neuritis. Uh, the first of these antibodies um, that was discovered a little over 10 years ago uh, was an antibody to um, a, a water channel, which is uh, called aquaporin, aquaporin 4, uh, which is now known to be um, the pathophysiologic target for autoimmune uh, response in this condition called neuromyelitis optica. Another antibody that's been identified more recently is to myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. This is uh, the antibody that we abbreviate as MOG. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these conditions here. Uh, so um, the first uh, kind of newly classified atypical optic neuritis is neuromyelitis optica, or NMO. Uh, so in this condition, there are autoantibody tar uh, auto antibodies that target this water channel, aquaporin-4, uh, on astrocytes, so these glial cells in the central nervous system. And the phenotype here is typically severe vision loss that may be bilateral and is often steroid resistant, and it's often associated with acute myelitis. So that's where this name neuromyelitis optica comes from. So the optica portion is that the optic nerves can be involved. And the myelitis portion is that you often get a similar kind of enhancement that you see in the optic nerves appearing in uh, longitudinally extensive portions of the spinal cord that can cause myelitis. And here's just a diagram uh, that shows some complement-mediated complement injury from these uh, uh, NMO antibodies um, attacking astrocytes, uh, then calling, causing myelinolysis or axonal swelling. <clears throat> and again, this affects either most commonly the optic nerves or the spinal cord. Um, and one of the reasons why it's been uh, having this antibody marker and uh, kind of new diagno diagnostic criteria for NMO is that treatment for these cases of atypical optic neuritis are vastly different than what we would do for kind of more of a classic demyelinating multiple sclerosis associated optic neuritis. Uh, so we still start with IV steroids, just like we would in a more severe case of typical optic neuritis, but uh, often these patients are steroid resistant. Uh, so we watch them closely, and if there's no improvement in vision after three to five days, we move quickly to plasma exchange or intravenous, intravenous immunoglobulin, uh, though there's more limited data on the latter. Um, and typically with these more invasive forms of immunomodulation, patient symptoms can be brought under, under control. Uh, but once they've kind of stabilized and they've, they've obtained as much visual improvement as they can, most experts in the field now recommend uh, lifelong B-cell depletion 
with an anti-CD20 agent to prevent recurrence of vision loss. Because with each event, uh, the, the vision loss can be so severe, and typically these patients don't return to their baseline visual acuity like you see in typical optic neuritis. Uh, another important reason that it's really helpful to have these new antibody markers and diagnostic criteria for neuromyelitis optica is that certain classic uh, multiple sclerosis drugs like interferon, uh, natalizumab, and fingolimod have actually been shown to worsen NMO disease activity. So we try to really define, is this multiple sclerosis or is this NMO before treating these patients just because they can have a paradoxical reaction to some of these classic. Um, with our patient, uh, who was anti-MOG positive, um, here we have this, this newly identified antibody that's uh, known to target oligodendrocytes. Uh, so similar to what we see uh, in kind of more typical uh, demyelinating optic neuritis where the target is the oligodendrocyte, but it's a different antibody and a different target on the oligodendrocyte cell. Uh, and MOG has long known to be a target uh, causing autoimmune encephalitis in pediatric patients. Um, but we now know that it can cause this new atypical optic neuritis phenotype. And, and the phenotype here is a re, uh, relapsing course, prominent optic disc swelling like we saw in this patient, uh, and typically a rapid response to ther uh, steroid therapy with a, a quick improvement in vision, um, but uh, also a uh, rapid relapse upon cessation of steroid treatment. So these patients often end up requiring an extended steroid taper uh, to keep their symptoms under control. Um, so back to our patient and to demonstrate this idea of kind of a steroid dependence or rapid recurrence after a steroid taper. Um, this is our patient uh, three weeks after he had been admitted to the hospital and treated with a three-day course of IV steroids followed by uh, an oral taper. Um, if you recall, when he initially presented, his visual acuity was 2100 in the right eye. It had improved to 2020, and his visual field had also significantly improved from diffuse depression now to just a few scattered areas in the periphery. He also now uh, had significant improvement in what was uh, initially a brisk right afferent pupillary defect. Now it appeared to be just a subtle right APD. He had full color perception at this point with a mean deviation on his visual field of minus 3. So this was three weeks out. He had just re recently tapered off of the steroid medication. He felt like he was doing great. But he came back one week later, and again, his vision had taken a significant turn for the worse. Uh, now he was 2,400 in the right eye with a brisk right after a pupillary defect again, dyschromatopsia, and significant di diffuse depression on uh, his mean deviation and on his visual field. So. Uh, this is a really good example of uh, an anti-MOG positive optic neuritis case um, that was exquisitely steroid responsive, but also appeared to be very steroid dependent uh, and required a much longer steroid taper than it, what is typically used to treat uh, demyelinating optic neuritis. So he ended up being restarted on steroids, um, oral prednisone. His vision again improved to 20 to, uh, to 2020. Uh, and the prednisone was gradually tapered over the course of about three months. And after that time, his vision remained stable at 2020 with the full visual field. <clears throat> uh, prior to identifying these, uh, this MOG antibody, uh, some, some ophthalmologists who have been in practice longer may recognize the term cryon or C-R-I-O-N. That's what we used to call these types of cases. So, um, Cryon would stand for chronic relapsing inflammatory optic neuropathy. So these were kind of poorly defined optic neuropathies that seem to be uh, frequently recurring, steroid responsive, steroid dependent. Now the terminology has kind of shifted over to um, you know atypical optic neuritis, either NMO or MOG positive atypical optic neuritis. So that's the last case, um, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions now. Um, 
about this last patient or uh, anything having to do with optic neuritis or these new antibodies that we have available for testing. Just waiting now for any questions to come in on the on the website. So um, Dr. Koresh uh, Muscati just wrote to ask, has there been no modification in the classical treatment recommendations after optic neuritis treatment trial? Um, that is true. So for kind of classic optic neuritis, demyelinating or MS-associated optic neuritis, the treatment um, recommendations have remained the same. So um, either do nothing. Um, so just observe the patient and expect that they will, their vision will kind of bottom, bottom out and then uh, gradually improve over the course of a few weeks or a few months. Um, or patients who are very concerned or have more severe vision loss, uh, typically based on the ONTT, treating with three days of IV steroids followed by a two-week taper of oral medications. Um, I, you know, in, in very classic cases, I tend not to treat my patients uh, at all. I just observe them. Um, and, but if there are any atypical findings, I, I typically um, will admit them to the hospital for IV steroids and send these, these new antibody tests that we have available for NMO um, and MOG. <clears throat> and if either of those come back positive, then that then leads you down a different treatment pathway. Um, so again, you know, for, for NMO cases, because these patients tend to have such severe steroid uh, resistant vision loss, you may end up with either plasmapheresis or IVIG during that hospitalization. And then, uh, like I had mentioned before, uh, most experts now recommend lifelong B-cell depletion uh, with an anti-CD20 agent to prevent relapse to preserve their vision for the going forward. Um, in terms of the MOG patients, it just would kind of dictate uh, a much longer oral prednisone taper to prevent a relapse. Um, the next question from Dr. Koresh Muscati, any role for interferon uh, therapy in treating these patients? <clears throat> so not in the atypical cases. Um, so uh, I mentioned uh, when I was talking about NMO that Interferon can actually has actually been shown to worsen the, the clinical picture of NMO. So um, one reason to do these antibody tests is to help kind of rule in and rule out certain kind of classic MS treatments. Um, but typically, uh, the, the way those patients are treated long term is with um, uh, B cell depletion uh, in the U.S. Uh, with medication called rituximab. It's an anti-CD20 agent. Um, in terms of these MOG patients, typically they can be treated just with steroids, uh, just uh, requiring a longer course of the medication. <clears throat> so these are all really good questions. Um, you know, and I think a lot of the basis of, of this talk today was um, what, uh, what kind of neuro-ophthalmic issue should you consider referring to a neurologist. Um, and, I, you know, I think that the main takeaway point from this last case is just to look for atypical findings in optic neuritis that could suggest that there was something something else, you know, potentially more sinister going on here. Um, and those atypical findings would be, you know, significant optic nerve swelling or disc hemorrhage on presentation, severe vision loss uh, to the level of light perception or no light perception. Um, 
visual acuity that continues to worsen after the first week or so. Um, those would all, or bilaterality, those would all be um, worrisome findings. <clears throat> Uh, and Dr. Koresh uh, had asked again, um, following up on any role for interferon uh, in classic cases. So uh, talking about more kind of typical demyelinating optic neuritis, I don't think so. Um, I think the recommendations remain um, either no treatment or a two-week course of combined IV and oral steroids. Um, you know, when someone has what looks like a classic case of optic neuritis, I typically refer them to see our MS specialist at our institution um, just to talk about risk factors uh, for future development of multiple sclerosis, sclerosis or just go over their imaging to say it looks like you have other white matter changes in the brain that are classic for multiple sclerosis, even if the patient has never had any other transient neurologic symptoms in the past. Um, and uh, you know, at that point, they may discuss the risks and benefits of starting some sort of um, long-term multiple sclerosis treatment versus observing to see if they develop any other uh, transient neurologic symptoms in the future. Uh, and I think that some of the MS specialists will do still treat with interferon just kind of as a general MS drug. Um, but uh, we've been fortunate uh, to have this kind of revolution of uh, treatment for MS over the last decade or so um, with uh, medications that uh, have been shown to be more effective and are, are better tolerated in patients. Uh, so I'm seeing, I'm seeing MS patients treated with interferon less and less in my practice. Uh, well, I, I appreciate all of these great questions, and uh, it has really been an honor for me to uh, do this webinar today um, and speak to ophthalmologists in India. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the invitation, and I hope that this has been helpful to everyone. Um, please feel free to reach out to me uh, if you have any follow-up questions or um, if there's anything else that I can do to help out from a neuro-ophthalmic perspective. Uh, my email address uh, is crandall.peeler at bmc.org, so my first name, dot last name, at BMC, which is for Boston Medical Center, org. And I'd be happy to take any questions over email. Um, but it's really been a pleasure, and thanks again for the invitation. Take care.